Thank you. So thank you for coming. My name is Sara Villen Perez. And yes, we'll talk about species distributions in the light of the, of the law of the minimum. So I will ask you to think in a species you know and imagine how will be the relationship between abundance and an environmental gradient for this species, for instance, temperature. And I guess you will imagine something like that, which is a line-shaped pattern. And when I say a line-shaped pattern, I imagine I'm referring to anything, any type of pattern, but where uh, sample points are distributed around a line with a certain error. But I guess instead of that, you may find a polygonal shaped pattern where sample units are distributed from zero to an upper limit. And why I say that? You may find this polygonal shaped pattern not by sampling error, but because ecological theory predicts that. So polygonal patterns are predicted by the law of the minimum, as it was stated by some authors in the past. The law of the minimum, or Liebig's law of the minimum, uh, was originally conceived for, for plants, and it states that growth is dictated not by total resources available, by, but by the scarcest resource, which is called the limiting factor. So uh, in the classical example of a barrel, the level of water will not be determined by all the states, but by the shortest one. And thinking in biogeography, the abundance of a species at a certain point in time and space will be determined not by, by all the environmental factors, but by, by the single most limiting factor. So how this relates to the uh, polygonal pattern? What is the, the prediction is that locations in the upper boundary will be locations where the limiting factor is that we are actually representing in our plot, in this case, temperature. And locations below the, this upper limit will be locations uh, that are limited, which abundance is limited by other limiting factors different from the one we are representing. So here the important point, the interesting point is the upper boundary, which represents the maximum potential abundance that the species could reach across the uh, environmental gradient we are measuring. And in the past, some authors called the attention of this and called for statistical tools to estimate the upper boundary. But today we have the answer and we know that we can estimate this upper boundary using quantile regression models. But what about these polygonal shaped patterns then? Are they really common and widespread? Can we easily identify them? And most important, are they of any interest for <laughs> biogeography? I will try to answer these questions. So first of all, we found that polygonal patterns are pervasive across taxa and regions. So we found them in peninsular Spain, both in winter inverse and in breeding birds from different databases. Also, we found them in the United States in breeding birds, in plants, in boreal plants of the understory layer in Finland, and also in trees in more than 180 species of trees in the United States. We then also made a literature review in ecology and biogeography journals, and we found 25, 21 papers uh, which had this uh, environment, abundance environmental plot with the point cloud that we could assess. And we found that 76% of, of these point clouds were actually polygonal shaped. And these uh, were for a variety of organisms and were distributed all across the world. But surprisingly, only 6% of these studies use quantile regressions to uh, assess the relationship between the abundance and the environmental gradient. So that means that they were not identifying these polygonal shaped patterns at that, as such. And none of them mentioned the law of the minimum. 
So even though we are aware that there are researchers using these uh, quantile regressions and, and acknowledging this type of patterns, we think that the community in general is not aware of the existence of these patterns and the, the theory behind that and the importance of them. So to help in this sense, we develop a new method to detect polygonal shaped patterns. And it's, the idea is very simple. We call it the filling index. So we, what we do is to rasterize our um, point cloud. So we identify these cells where there is a data point. And we also identify the, the upper boundary. And then we calculate the occupation rate below the upper boundary. Assuming that polygonal shaped patterns will have a higher filling index than line shaped patterns. To test it, we created uh, simulations for line shaped patterns. So with that, we create a null distributions of filling indexes. And we compare that with the observed filling index we want to test. And we are able to distinguish between uh, distributions that are not significantly different from line shaped patterns and distributions that are significantly dis different from line shaped patterns. So this is not published yet, but we hope it will be soon. And we expect that will help uh, researchers to be aware of the, the shape of their distributions and thus the, the theory and the methods that should apply to analyze them. And then most important is this interesting for biogeography. I will bring here two main points. So the first one, is that polygonal point clouds may inform about the fundamental needs of a species. So we know, we all know that there are some locations where the, reali the realized needs of the species does not match with the fundamental needs because there are competitor species that uh, constrain them further from that. But there may be locations where, where these two needs uh, match. And we, uh, our hypothesis is that these locations uh, where, the, where the species is reaching the fundamental niche are located in the upper boundary of the polygonal shaped pattern. So if we were relating the abundance of the species again, against temperature, this upper boundary of the distribution may be informing about the thermal fundamental niche of the species. And in this sense, we could be able to assess the fundamental needs for different uh, factors. So to test this hypothesis, we needed species uh, with known fundamental needs, realized needs and abundance. So we work with virtual species and I will not uh, go into details, but we uh, generated the fundamental needs for a variety of climatic and resource variables. Then we include interactive species, both facilitator and competitor species. So we have the realized needs. And uh, we include also dispersion and population dynamics. So we get the abundance of the species and we sample it to get the final uh, simulated database. And this is uh, how it looks, one of the, the first examples. So at this point, I, I hope you, you are thinking, wow, a polygonal shaped pattern, yes. But most interesting is that the upper part of the, the curve, as it was expected, is where we found the fundamental niche. So the fundamental niche is in the upper boundary of this distribution, and we are approaching it uh, using uh, these quantile regressions. So this is work in progress. This is, uh, these are preliminary, pre preliminary results, but uh, they are suggesting that we may be able to estimate the fundamental niche of the species through correlations, through correlative data, which could be uh, very interesting. The second point of interest is that limiting theory uh, may be useful for climate change biogeography. 
So we are able to forecast shifts in the maximum potential abundance of a species, which means that we are uh, saying that the abundance of the species in the future will be at any point from zero to an upper limit. And this way we are able to detect climatic releases and climatic constraints and assume that there are other factors that we cannot predict uh, for future. And we can translate this to, to community also, as we did for trees in the United States, where we predicted that climate change will lead to denser but less diverse forests in the future with consequential uh, resilience uh, challenges, but also carbon sequestration opportunities. So to summarize, we think that the perspective of ecological limits offers promising opportunities both for theoretical ecology and climate change biogeography. And I would like to thank especially my co-authors and my funding agencies and collaborating entities. And thank you for your attention. I will be pleased to answer any question here or by email. Thank you very much.